And then yesterday, as I was leaving uh, Northern California, I, I gave some flowers that I had in the house for Mom's Day to a neighbor lady, and I dumped the water down the disposal. And I always put a couple of pennies in the water because they say it keeps flowers fresh. And as I turned on the disposer to flush the water down, I realized the damn pennies are in there in the disposer. <laughs> and I'm, I'm running to catch a plane. I'm thinking, oh, what's going on? We have the little uh, uh, Yamaha disc clavier piano that is the CNBC Orchestra, and we thank them for that. And the light that shines on that piano uh, blew out here about three minutes ago. So Michael Hollander of our staff, I don't know if you can get a shot of him in the darkness back there, but he's on a ladder. <laughs> there he is. Wave. <laughs> don't fall down now, Mikey. Michael Hollander of our staff is up there quietly uh, replacing the light bulbs so as we can see the orchestra. And I understand the smokehouse got the message and a piano player oh. is, is on the way. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, standing by is Ted David of the uh, CNBC staff back there in Fort Lee. And Ted was actually on the air today when fire struck the studios on Fletcher Avenue in Fort Lee. Hi, Ted, it's Tom. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I hear you fine, Tom. Okay, T tell us the story, pal. You know, you're, you were there when history happened today. Well, first of all, I can't, I can't tell you, uh, there are a few networks who would be as lucky as to have the likes of you. Ah, come on. Fill in. Well, that's true. Thanks. Actually, I was not on the air. I got off the air at 4 o'clock Eastern Time and ran out to get myself something to eat and yep. stopped off to have a battery in my watch changed. When I came back, <laughs> there was half of the Fort Lee Fire Department and black smoke belching out of the side of one of the, the uh, air registers. Yeah. I must say, by the way, those guys are volunteer firemen. Hats off to them, because each and every one of them left jobs that they were working. Sure. And they are skilled people, and it was, you know, you, you felt good to see them there doing what they, they do well. Anyway... So we all milled around, and it was like a high school fire drill. In fact, we were kidding right. around. Hey, you, no talking on a fire drill. <laughs> and eventually, uh, I must say also, Roger Ailes is an interesting guy to watch. Yes, he is, a gun. In, in many ways. <laughs> well, let me tell you. Let me tell you something. You know, you, you, you see people in different perspectives, and when under the gun, I mean, this guy is clear, quick thinking, and has his hands on things. No question. And in a matter, I mean, like a, a sergeant, uh, you know, out in the, in the combat field was lining this one up and that one up and so on. And it was determined that I would, because they said we may let four people up and no more. Right. That would be one anchor person, one director, one technical person of another kind, and that's it. And then, of course, Roger Ailes would not be one of those going back in. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, he did go back oh, in. Oh, he did. And, and, by, and by the way, when, when you referred to Roger as a sergeant, you used the wrong rank. You know that. Uh, I think I said General, Tom. I, <laughs> okay, go ahead, Ted. I think I said, I think I said uh, General. Anyway. Just kidding, uh, Roger. So he came up with us, and, you know, it's funny because I don't have to tell you, uh, you become used to so many electronic conveniences in, in TV that, yep. uh, you know, teleprompters and chirons, as you referred, referred to and so on, and it's suddenly like, hey, Roger, I think you may have to run the prompter for me, <laughs> which, which he said he would readily Sure, do. absolutely. But as it turned out, you know, the heck with the prompter. We had uh, Woody, as we call him, Chuck Woodruff, who's Surely. our coordinating director, actually r switching, which for those folks watching, is he's actually pushing the buttons to camera one and camera two and so on, and directing at the same time. It was basically him and me and one person in audio and somebody playing the tapes back. Well, the great thing about this is, you know, Ted, this is not rocket science that we do here. It's really basically very simple. Uh, we have a lot of electronic help, as you mentioned, the chirons, the graphics, the teleprompter, etc. But basically, if you have a camera working and a light on, you can do this, as you and I are demonstrating right now. Well, the smoke was accurate, I will say that. Uh, there was... I walked up the stairs because I'm claustrophobic enough in elevators when there isn't a problem. Right. And I, so we were walked, up, walked upstairs with water sloshing down, in some cases, three yeah. inches of it. Uh, firemen wearing Scott Life packs, you know, air packs, everywhere we went, got on the air, and, uh, we, you know, we conducted several interviews with people at our various remote locations and so on. Right, but now there, there comes a time, I guess, from what Mark Rosenweig told me, when you could not stay on the air anymore. Well, what happened was then my colleague uh, Sue Herrera came up, and right. she joined me at the anchor desk just in time for the fire people to say, uh, as Mark indicated, uh, there's a problem with these batteries yeah. and some kind of noxious fumes and get out. And they just dropped out of us, went to uh, whatever, and we, we were out the door. I did grab Sue's pocketbook on the way out. <laughs> oh, stop it. I remember when I used to work across the, uh, the uh, street at KNBC, uh, 
every four or five months we'd get a bomb scare. You know, some nut would call in and say, you know, I planted a bomb in the NBC, and they would, they would evacuate the building, but they would say to those people in the newsroom, if you want to stay, it's okay. I always left the building. I figured I didn't want to be a hero, because you never know, and when there's smoke as there was at Fort Lee, why stick around? When the fire department says get out, I think you got to get out. I think you did the right thing. You know, I worked at a radio station in New York City as a disc jockey at one point where management kind of frowned on, on the thought of, of the, the jocks leaving even yeah. when, when the alarms went off. And, you know, you'd look for Inagata De Vita, uh, MacArthur Park, uh, and perhaps, you know, <laughs> some other nine-minute records you yeah. could bring together. <laughs> But, yeah. Anyway, listen, Ted, take the rest of the night off. I'm going to do that. All right. Good to talk to you, Tom. Thank you, Ted, and thanks for being with us. I hope to see you soon. I enjoyed being with you in April back there in Fort Lee. Likewise. Okay, thank you. Take care. Uh, Mr. Ted David, uh, correspondent for CNBC on the uh, money wheel portion of our programming in the afternoon, who was at work today uh, as the fire broke out and went back in when it was safe for a time and then finally had to give up when... The fire department said the smoke was acrid and acid and acidic and dangerous, and uh, they all left and are now, I guess, partying till they drop back there. <laughs> As I said to the people here, you know, when something like this happens, the best thing to do is just not to get too excited, you know, just calmly go about our business. Why hasn't he got the light fixed yet? I really don't know, he's, but he's, I think he's got it. How many, how many bureau chiefs does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> well, we're finding out. <laughs> I'm, 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 the slow process, and I have to do it so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a break coming up, Michael. you got about three and a half minutes to make all the noise you want, kid. I'm Tom. This is the color cast now for uh, Tuesday night. We'll be back with you in just a couple of moments here on the CNBC Television Network. Okay, we are back. I'm Tom Snyder filling in here for uh, Cal Thomas, who was supposed to be on the air tonight with the former Vice President, Dan Quayle. That interview is being done back in Manhattan as we speak, and God willing, and facilities available, it'll be done uh, at this time, I believe, tomorrow night or maybe next Tuesday night. Uh, I have no idea. They asked me to wear the earpiece, you know. Why, why do they call it the IFB? Internal feedback. Internal feedback. I have two versions. I have the Michael Horowitz version, interrupted feedback, and I have the Mark Kennedy uh, uh, internal feedback. Whichever it is, whichever it is, I ain't, ain't going to wear it. The reason I have Mr. Kennedy here is to tell me what to do when things go bad. Uh, a couple of weeks back, we went down to a place in uh, Burbank called Lenny Marvin's. It's a prop house. You've seen this piece before. Uh, Lenny rents props out to movie companies if they need slot machines or if they need jukeboxes, telephones, radios, anything that the director or the set designer needs to dress the set for a motion picture is available by rental from Lenny Marvin. And we thought you might like to see that again, and it'll give us a little breathing room here in the studio. Here is a visit to Lenny Marvin's. Folks, this is the uh, barber shop at the Lenny Marvin Prop uh, Warehouse uh, in Burbank, and this is Gail who does my all-star makeup. Just put a few touches on there with you, kid, before we start. In this building, you will find artifacts that have appeared in motion pictures and television programs uh, starting back in the 1970s when Lenny began this business in, of all places, his garage in Chatsworth, California. I have known this man for the better part of 20 years. As a matter of fact, back in the 70s, on the old Tomorrow Show, we had to have a roulette table. And Lenny said, do you want the 1920s, the 1930s, the 19... and so on. He's got them from all, all uh, time periods. And uh, from that garage in Chatsworth has come this enormous warehouse. And Lenny has opened the vault to us, and we'll take a look around here and show you things that are absolutely incredible, used as props in motion pictures and movies for television. Take a look at the magazine rack over here, and take a look at all the stuff around this warehouse, the Lenny Marvin place, just down the road from our studios in Burbank. And if you think you've seen this stuff before, guess what? You have. And here is the man responsible for it all, my friend Lenny Marvin, who started back, as I said, in a garage in Chatsworth and now has an enormous collection of, well, televisions and radios. Lenny, come over and talk to me here a little bit. All right. What's, what's some interesting to me is when I was a kid on 24th Place in Milwaukee, that was the first television screen we watched. What, what, that's a seven-inch screen, isn't it? Yeah, approximately, yes. Yeah. yes. Isn't that a, where do you find all these television sets? Uh, actually, uh, up until about 10 years ago, you could find them in swap meets throughout the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are collectors that amass things in their garages throughout the United States and Europe. And then finally, they get tired of it and they sell it. And they usually put it in an antique magazine. 
and as they have collection for sale. So then you are a collector first and foremost. Oh, to amass absolutely. all this, you would have to collect. And then what is the call for these in movies for television and theatrical movies? Uh, the way a movie prop house works is uh, the major studios, except for furniture, are getting out of the technical things because it's so hard to find, you have to be a specialist. Right. And uh, so knowing this stuff, loving it, collecting it, I just made it available to the industry. You know, let's just stop here at one of Lenny's uh, slot machines here and try our luck, you know, see if we can't pick up a couple of bucks. Round and round and round they go, and where they stop, no, nope. oh, hey, I think we got a winner here. Hey, hey, wow. Dinner's on me, guys. If we can all eat for 750. <laughs> We're rich! <laughs> <laughs> now here's the fun stuff. Jukeboxes, pinball machines, arcade games, stuff like that. Uh, people would have seen jukeboxes like this in Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, maybe? Exactly. Yeah? Yes. What They're are some of the... Uh, like, you did Dick Tracy, all yes, the phones and everything? Uh, everything, yeah. What about... Um, I noticed in one part here, and we'll show it as you talk about it, You've got grocery products from through the years. Yes, yes. Uh, talk to me here about what you have. Depending on what you do. Uh, oh, what was that picture with Sally Field? Oh, it was done. It was like in Texas in the 1930s. Well, we had oh, a ship. Oh, oh, I know the one yeah, you mean. Yeah. She's, uh, she's going to gotta save the farm. That's the one. We had a ship an entire 1930s grocery store to them down there. How does this get to the movie studios? Who calls you? The set decorators? The set decorators and art directors we deal with and some prop masters, but okay. mainly set decorators. Yes. And have they ever stumped you? Tell the truth now. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like the old commercial years ago. They'd say, well, do you have a submarine? And I'd say, no, no, but I'll get one. <laughs> <you know? laughs> uh, but we have, I've, I've bet it pretty good. Over I'm, the oh, years, I'm sure you yeah. have, but I'm sure that every now and again, somebody will come up with something and you say to yourself, my God, how do they ever come up with that? Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that writers do that just doesn't exist. Is there ever a time when this whole wa warehouse is empty? Whatever? Yes, yeah. very often. Like if you line up and you'll see maybe 50 pinball machines and 50 or 60 yeah. jukebox, particularly the pinballs and the video games, if they're doing a huge arcade, they might say, well, give me from here to the end. And the same thing, like you mentioned, the general store, the pharmacy, the decorators come in and they see it set up mm -hmm. and they'll say, well, I want everything from this shelf all the way down to the end. Yeah. yeah. And then how do you write that up on a yellow sheet and, and determine a it's price? On a computer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Space age technology. I got today, you. Yeah. I got you. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, thirty day pay, please. Yeah. <laughs> Lenny, thanks for the tour, my friend. It's always a joy to see you. Thank you, Tom. And keep it humming, will you? Thank you, my friend. All right, Thank Lenny you. Marvin, folks. <laughs> Think you've seen this stuff before, including him and me? Like I said, you have. <laughs> That's a very nice touch. That piece was put together by Chip Bell of our producing staff, and I thank Chip for his effort there. It turned out very, very well. We should do more stuff like that, you know, where we go out and around, and we will. We will, for heaven's sake. Uh, I'm Tom. This is an extended version of our color cast. We're filling in right now for Cal Thomas, who, uh, whose program was wiped out by the fire at CNBC on Fletcher Avenue back in Fort Lee, New Jersey this afternoon. We'll start taking your phone calls to moi. You know, so many of you write in here. And you, you say, Tom, why can't we have a chance just to talk to you on the phone about the show and stuff we see and not have guests? And tonight we're going to have a good bit of that. We start now with Gary somewhere in Georgia. Hi, Gary. You're on the air. Hey, Tom. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are we doing, Gary? Okay? Not bad, Tom. Not, not, bad, not bad, he says. Good, good. Not bad. Good. What can yeah, I do for you? Three hours you? of Tom Snyder. There's a dream come true. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. not, not for Larry King. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Hey, uh, I, st I spent three hours staring at the eclipse today, Tom. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was on TV. You know? I know, but you see, the problem we had here in Southern California was it was foggy until noon, so we didn't see any of it. Oh, is that right? Uh, how did it look in, in, whereabouts in Georgia are you? I'm in Warm Springs, Georgia. Okay. Well, how did it look? On, on the Alabama state line. I, I know exactly where it is. I used to live in Atlanta. Okay. And, uh, Matter of fact, you probably know Warm Springs from uh, FDR. That's here. exactly right. He passed away there, and the train took him up through Atlanta to, uh, to Hyde Park eventually for burial. That's right. As a matter of fact, uh, the little white house is still here. No kidding. And do people still go there? Oh, you wouldn't believe the people that still go there. Oh, no, there. I would believe that. I would uh, believe they, that. They, they have busloads every day. It's, uh, it's a very small town. It's only about 500 people. You know, there was a man uh, who played the accordion uh, for a, uh, a club in Atlanta, a black man, and he was 
he played the accordion as Roosevelt's funeral train passed through Atlanta back in 1944. And he later went on to great success there. He played a piano and organ composition piece at a restaurant in, uh, in uh, Marietta, Georgia, called uh, The Battle of Atlanta. I'm trying to think of his name here, and it, it's just not coming to me. But uh, that, that whole story of Roosevelt and Warm Springs, the summer White House, is sure. still very, very popular with fans of FDR and fans of American history. Yeah, yeah, it, it certainly is. And but, the, that's the, not why, but that's not why you called. Well, it could be. <laughs> I'm a flexible guy, Tom. I understand that, Gary. Yes, absolutely. Um, you were in Savannah when you were here? Yes, sir. I worked there for th uh, three years. Did you, did you enjoy Georgia? Did you get to see much of Georgia? Oh, you? sure. I used to drive all the time between Savannah and Atlanta because I had kin. In fact, I still do have uh, relatives in Atlanta, Georgia. And so I drive, uh, you know, what's the old road? Highway 260 from, 260, that's right. know, from Savannah to Atlanta through the mountains. Listen, kid, I got a commercial coming. I got to go, but I thank you for calling. Okay, good luck to you All tonight. right, thanks, Gary. I appreciate right, you watching. Okay, yeah. we'll be right back with more of our show from, uh, from Burbank after these messages. <laughs> Okay, we sure hope you enjoyed the first Cal Thomas show from 8 to 8.30, and now it's time for Equal Time with Mary Madeline, but because of the fire, you got Snyder, okay? I'll be your host here for Mary Madeline tonight, guest hosting, Tom Snyder, here at the studios in Burbank, California. On the wire, we have Mr. Cal Thomas, who was to have premiered a half an hour ago on this network with a very special guest, the former Vice President of the United States, Dan Quayle. But because of the fire at CNBC, it's on uh, it's on delay. But Cal is with us now live on the phone. Hi, Cal. It's Tom. Can you hear us okay? Well, I can, Tom. Thank you very much. You know, when they told me earlier today to break a leg, the old show business good luck uh, charm, they should have said start a fire. I think we yeah, could have right. been a better Burn yourself up. I mean, geez. This is amazing. I'll tell you, we, we, had, uh, we had this smoke throughout the building, and the whole place was evacuated. I haven't done anything like that since I was in uh, elementary school. Yeah, right. When you said it, right. <laughs> So you know, did... uh, you're doing three hours tonight. If I ever get a terminal illness, would you come on and do my telethon? Sure, I will. As, as a matter of so fact, good. By, by the time we finish tonight, Cal, we hope to have raised about 800000 for Jerry's kids. <laughs> hey, hey, that's great. I, I'm proud of you. Well, I, let me I'm ask you here, excited. Cal, about, uh, about uh, Dan Quayle and what you fellas talked about and how you think it went. Give us a little preview, if you would. Well, he's on this book tour. I asked him if yeah. it was uh, more fun uh, being on a presidential campaign or a book tour. He laughed, and uh, I don't think he really made up his mind on it. But yeah. I, there's some news in it, and uh, I don't want to scoop myself, but I, I think he's got some solid things to say, some accusations about the uh, condition of our uh, military. He doesn't think that it's as in good a shape as it was in 1990 when we uh, won the Persian Gulf War. Right. He's also talking about, uh, as he has before, uh, whether he's going to run for president or not. I happen to think that he will. He's going to be testing the waters uh, this summer during his book tour right. and out around the country. Let me ask you here about something I read in, in I believe, the Newsweek magazine excerpted his book last week. Hmm. He was, it, not I shouldn't say extremely critical, but he, he it's no secret that he and Jim Baker were not the best of the, uh, in the Bush White House. True? That is true. They, uh, they had more than a personality clash. Uh, uh, Jim Baker did not want him selected uh, for the ticket in 1988 in the first place. And there was some friction. It's sort of like, uh, you know, your father-in-law not wanting you to marry his daughter. There's yeah. a little suspicion there yeah. during the marriage. And did, did you talk about that at all? I mean, does this feeling continue between the two to, to this day? Well, because, I mean, because, I mean, there's talk that Baker might be considering a run for the White House himself in 1996. I read where he said, you know, don't, don't take my name completely off the list right now. Right. Well, I asked him uh, if uh, he felt that if he ran, he would be in the number one position. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to go for that, but uh, obviously, clearly, uh, he would be. And I also asked him if, uh, if there's something he felt he needed to do uh, dramatic, like uh, recite the theory of relativity from memory, to convince people that he's not dumb as a rock. And he said no. He just thought rather than trying to go for the home run, he'd just try to hit singles, get on base and advance uh, one base at a time. I, I think that's probably the right strategy. Yeah, I noticed, too, that uh, he made reference to the uh, what has come to be known as the Murphy-Brown speech, and he said, you know, even Bill Clinton uh, said that Dan Quayle made some good points in that speech, and Clinton did say that about the former vice president. Well, clearly he is on to something here. I mean, when you can get the other party, in this yeah. case the Democratic Party, to pretty much adopt your agenda, particularly on the family values questions, obviously people are concerned not only about crime in the street, but uh, crime in the schoolyard. And and uh, crack cocaine in the schoolyard and these other things. But I asked him whether he thought that government could do a lot uh, to 
caused kids to be chased before marriage, cause people to be right. fathers to their children, this sort of thing. And he said, well, obviously, you know, there'll be certain tax legislation, but uh, mostly it's the bully pulpit setting an example and saying the things that need to be yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, something, by the way, that George Bush uh, uh, was not too good at doing. Well, you know, on the Murphy Brown thing you mentioned, it was funny, if you recall, uh, right after he made the speech, Marlon Fitzwater, then the White House press secretary, right. trotted out on the lawn and uh, tried to make excuses and say, well, we don't really feel that strongly. We know Murphy Brown's a positive television program. Right. Uh, and unfortunately, I think, ruined the impact of what he was talking about. This was typical of the Bush administration. Well, they, they did not help their vice president in these situations. There's well, no, that's right. No, well, I no. think he's been vindicated in the end, Tom. I mean, when you, when you have the Democratic convention and virtually the entire Clinton administration at least talking the talk about family values, I think he can declare victory. Unfortunately, he has to do it for him, unfortunately, from Indianapolis and not from Washington. Okay. Anyway, Cal, when can we see this program? Well, they're talking about running it tomorrow night because Terrific. there's some new stuff in it. But what is it, Andy? I'm getting instructions even right now. This is how we're at living. Is that, by the show. way, is that my protege, Andy Friendly, there? It is, yes. Oh. He's sitting there watching your image right now, <laughs> and he says it's a great tie you've got on. How is my protege tonight, okay? Well, he is. He combed his hair. He washed his socks. He looks pretty good. Good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, when? You think tomorrow night, Cal? Uh, I think they just made the decision next Tuesday in the regular slot at 8 p.m. Oh, great. I mean, there's news in this, so let's hold it for a whole week, right? Yeah, they don't have much news judgment. I tried to tell them. I said, the worst thing you can do is sit on a lead story. It's going to come out on Why? A well, for God's sake, why don't they run it tomorrow night? Well, hey, why don't we run it tomorrow night? Because Al Roker has got a program on. Is this great management or what? Who's Al Roker got on, ask him. Who has Al Roker got on, Andy? He's got the current vice president. He's got the current vice No, he doesn't know. He does. <laughs> <laughs> but he, Andy did make a, a major management decision, Tom. He's just authorized pizza for you and the entire crew. Hey, 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 listen. Andy's my good friend, and, and, and he ordered what, pizza? Pizza for you and the entire crew. He does say he's, he's waffling now. He's, he's like the politician. He said, we may, after all, run it tomorrow night. Hey, we already have filet mignon from the smokehouse. Who is she? <laughs> Cal, let uh, Johnny do the jokes, and you do the Dan Quayle interviews, okay? Okay, that's very good. I'll talk I'm to you soon, to, Cal. I'm to audition for summer relief. Uh, all right, bye-bye, Cal. Thanks very much, uh, Okay, Tom. all right, good luck, pal. Cal Thomas, uh, newest member of our Talk All-Star team, bumped tonight by the fire program he did with Dan Quayle, Vice President, will be on the air a week from tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Yeah. 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 Is the light on the piano fixed? Yeah. You ready? Hit it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Good evening, folks. I'm Tom. This is the Geraldo Rivera program. Uh, here's Geraldo right here on the screen. <laughs> hey, how are you, guy? Good to see you. Nice to see you, Tom. I can talk a lot when I left. <laughs> anyway, uh, the Geraldo show will not be on the air tonight because of fire damage in, uh, in uh, Fort Lee today. And uh, we'll be here with you through this hour as we program the CNBC television network for our affiliates across the country and our viewers that I hope are with us tonight. We'll try and keep... Uh, Fresh programming coming your way from now until 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and then I would assume the network will go into repeat yeah. mode. By the way, uh, the fire this afternoon was a two-alarmer. It started on the fifth floor of the uh, CNBC facility in Fort Lee, New Jersey, just across the river from New York City. Uh, damage, I suppose, is extensive, most of it from water, I'm given to understand, by Mark Rosenweig, who is the, uh, by, or is the director of primetime programming for uh, the network. They made a go at trying to get back on the air shortly after 4 o'clock uh, Eastern Daylight Time today, but then uh, the, the smoke just got too thick and the fire department uh, and the health people said get out of the building, uh, which they have done. So I would assume that our staff is now dispersed to their homes and they're comfortable. But I'm told that there is a group of engineering personnel, uh, men and women, boys and girls of the color cast, if you will, uh, at work somewhere within the bowels of 30 Rockefeller Plaza in New York, New York tonight, uh, serving as transmission engineers for this program. Now, I don't know your names, and I don't know the name of your unit right now, but I'm going to make it a point to find out here before we go off the air. 
Without these people, uh, this network would simply not be operating tonight. Uh, in, 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 in place of our usual uh, Vivex landlines to Fort Lee, we are using satellite technology uh, to backhaul back to 30 Rock, and then somehow they're getting it to the cable affiliates around the country. Uh, and you know who you are, and I want you to know that we are deeply appreciative of your working uh, the late shift here tonight. And try and see if we can find that out, Mark, and we'll give these people some credit as we go along. Um, as I say, we are putting together programming uh, um, literally as it happens here. We have no facilities for graphics. Uh, we are running commercials from last night's program. That would be your Cadillac commercial <laughs> for your North Star in the four-door with black. <laughs> both in <laughs> and a little bit later on we'll have our regular color cast we do have some guests booked for that uh, we have a piano player in the house mr sterling is with us tonight sterling and uh, we'll get to him introduce him to you shortly find out what caused him to be here and i understand we're getting some help from jay leno and david letterman both of whom by now have finished taping their programs for late night viewing on the big time television networks later on tonight so back here uh, with uh, well, a, a couple of calls. People are waiting. Uh, Peggy in upstate New York. Hi, it's Tom. Hello. Hi, Tom. How are you, Peggy? You're a treat. Oh, thanks. You're better than than Geraldo. Except I don't want to be overexposed tonight, you know? <laughs> Never. Okay. Never. Tom, I have a question. For, I have a couple questions. Go ahead. Who's the most interesting person that you've ever interviewed? Well, there are several. Uh, Sterling Hayden, the late actor uh, who wrote a couple of books about his experiences, was an extremely interesting man. Uh, there, there were a couple of people uh, named uh, Will and Ariel Durant uh, who, who wrote books. They, were, they, were, they weren't really philosophers, but they were thinkers. And they, they wrote things uh, uh, that, that required you to, you to work if you read their, their, their works. And I, I enjoyed interviewing them a great deal. And the other fellow that I found uh, uh, truly uh, interesting, obviously, was Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, yeah. For obvious yeah. reasons, you know. <laughs> Which brings me to my next question. Yeah. What's the best book you've ever read? Hmm. I mean, that's, that's a tough one, but... Um, I'm going to mention two books to you. Uh, one is called... Well, uh, I'm going to mention three books for you. I like David Niven's books. The first one was called uh, Send in the Clowns. Right. Uh, no, 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 no. Balloon. Yeah. The moon, moon is a balloon. Moon's a balloon. And, and then the next one was called Send in the Horses, as I recall. Right, right. And then there was another one, a fiction book. I can't recall the author, but the title of the book was Young Blood Hawk. Long time ago. I liked that book a great deal. That was a good one. Best recent book is the one that Bill Carter did on the late, uh, late shift about David Letterman and Jay Leno and Johnny Carson. Very well researched and well done book. I enjoyed it. What was your favorite, Peg? Um, Bright's Head Revisited. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very good. Great book. Peggy, I'm glad you called. Thanks. Did you hear from Jack? Jack? Nicholson. No. No. Jack's out playing a Mercedes this afternoon. <laughs> as long as he doesn't get in trouble. Yeah. I saw Jack today. He's great. He's great. Good. Take Thanks care, Peggy. Tom. All right. Bye-bye. Appreciate the compliment. Michael in Wichita. Hello. Hi, Tom. It's great to talk to you. Thank you, Michael. It's nice to be spoken to. Tom, I had a question for you. It's not deep or serious great. or anything. Great. Great. But I uh, wondering if you had an official fan club. I don't think so. Well, you know, you're, you're quite a cult figure here in Wichita, and I, I just thought that they should get some governing body to uh, oversee all of those fans. I would think that the best way to establish that would be for all potential members to send me $10 cash. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding, Michael. I don't want your money. <laughs> well, I don't have too much to send you anyway. Michael, I'm very glad you called, and I hope you enjoy the program we do here on a regular basis. I really do. I just sent you a letter last week, as a matter of fact. Okay. Uh, anything else, Michael? No, I'll just sit back and enjoy the next couple hours. Hey, have a color teeny now. Yes, sir. Okay, good night, Michael. Night. All right, one more who's been waiting. John here in Burbank from right around the corner. Hi, John, it's Tom. Hi, Tom, how are you? Okay, thanks. My $10 is in the mail. No, stop it. Don't send any money in here. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a fan of yours for over 20 years. Thank you. I saw you back in New York, and I was real happy when you got a radio show out here in L.A. Yeah, it was terrific, thanks. And I'm real happy to see you on CNBC. I'm happy to be here, John. Thanks. But I have to tell you, I'm disappointed that they canceled your portfolio and money tonight. John, what do you want from me? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, 
I want a favor. Yeah. I want to give a message to NBC management. Go ahead. I want them to put Meet the Press on on Sundays at a reasonable time and not 7 in the morning so anybody who gets up at a decent time can't see it here in Los Angeles. Is that when they run Meet the Press in L.A.? You know, they have these things called videotape machines, John. You can watch it whenever you want. But you can't find out when it's going to be on because the Sunday paper doesn't get delivered until after the show is shown. Right you are. Right you are. I'll tell you, I'm going to call, uh, uh, who runs this thing, Bob Wright? Mm -hmm. I'm going to call him after the show and get this done, John. Thank you very much. Okay, pal. Thanks for calling. Bye. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> the, the phone will ring back at 30 Rock. Tom who? Yeah. yeah. We will continue with David Horowitz uh, and talk about, uh, hey, if you have a fire in your house, how do you handle it? We'll be right back after these messages. I've known David Horowitz for more than 20 years. He's one of my best friends in broadcasting, and he's here tonight, and I really appreciate him coming over because I'm stuck, and I'm glad to see a face that I... <laughs> you wish it is, to... folks. No, Tom, I want to tell you something. I am your biggest fan, and I want to be officially the first member of your national fan club and a hope honorary president i cannot take your money sir. why not you you are the honorary president and, <laughs> and 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 free member now tell the folks here yeah. there was an earthquake in los angeles in 1971 and david horowitz was the only person at nbc in burbank and he'll pick up the story from there i mean this what you're doing tonight Tom, rivals anything that happened then. Oh, no, but... All right, tell. 1971. Here was David Horowitz. He used to do the early morning news. I That's came right. in at 4.30 in the morning. Got your 7.25 cut in, your 8.25 cut in. All that stuff, in. except that 6.01 in the morning, the building started to fall apart. It shook, the light fixtures were torn loose, typewriters were flying all over the room. And, you know, in those days, you know, with were high-budget productions here at NBC, I was the only one on the staff to do that show. That's right. I had that and a new editorial assistant who had just started that morning. I didn't know what happened. Of course, I had never been in an earthquake before. And so what I did is I ran down to my car and I tuned in the radio since it was black in the building. Right. And I heard on the radio that they think they had an earthquake. Mm -hmm. So then I saw these trucks, the NBC Peacock trucks, leaving the lot. And I said, where are you guys going? And they said, to the Bob Hope Desert Classic. <laughs> I said, guys, we've had a tragedy here. What are we going to do? So what I did is I managed to get one truck to stay behind. And it and was able to generate a picture, right? It could generate a picture, live television. We shot up to our, to our Mount Wilson transmitter, which is on auxiliary power. And there I stood in the parking lot. I got a guy with his car who had a CB band radio. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a two-way. The helicopter went up. And I stood there for about two hours and did spontaneous reports, got the wire stories we didn't have. So a guy typed the reports off the radio station. And were, weren't you the only guy on television in Los Angeles for like two or three hours that That's morning? That's right. And I remember they called us because I, I had just moved here. I had only yeah. been with the station for, uh, let's see, it was, uh, it was 1971, right? That's right. And I came, I joined the station in August of 70. So I've been here, so I was at home. And they finally got us on the phones at around 10 o'clock or 10.30 in the morning. I think I was there, and Tom Pettit, member, was over, and uh, was there. Erwin Safchik was writing for us, and, uh, and you carried it for, like, what, three hours? That's right. Like that. But no guess. <laughs> I know. And, uh, did we you had have, no guess. Did you have phones? Could you get on the phone at I all? Had the, I had the walkie-talkie. I was talking to the helicopter. Oh, there Arnie you go. Condon. There Arnie you go. Condon was up in the air. I had Rich Rudis, who had just started that day I as remember, an editorial sure. assistant. Sure who was listening to the radio and typing the reports off the radio and handing them to me and also monitoring the emergency frequencies on this on the citizens band radio that he had in the car and that's all that i had there it's really interesting when you look back at it that very sparse news coverage the stuff that we were getting early in the morning aside from the fact that when there was an aftershock you could see the aftershock sure i remember i was watching you like every once in a while you, one of those would go you by, grab one you know? of those yeah. my heart dropped into my you know where but uh, the, the interesting part about that is the accuracy of the stuff that we were getting in terms of what stood yeah. up throughout the whole earthquake. We were getting accurate information. It's truly amazing when you think about it, how when, uh, when wait, we have to have you hold this up because we, we can't generate any. It, it just, just, just says your name. Oh. Because we don't have any supers, so in case people don't know who you are as they're surfing around the dial, we want to, you know... You know, this looks like one of those things at a trial in the Middle East. Yeah, you stand yeah, up yeah, yeah. And now... I did it. I will not speak. I will speak. I will speak. And Please, now, guys, can do we have the, do it to can, me. Can we have your favorite profile, please? Here we go. Yeah. How's this? Here we go, folks. Here we go. Here we are. We're ready for you. You know, Tom, I think you're the fabulous, my darling. I'd love to have you on my show. This really is terrific. It's you know, this will become a standard in television. And later on, 
We'll see Harvey Levin. I'll tell you, we don't waste anything on this show. No, no. We don't waste cue cards. Here they are, folks. As, as a matter of fact, you may play Harvey Levin's part all by yourself. Who would know? Hey, no one would know. Except Harvey. And Except his, Harvey. And his pals. And now, Harvey's probably on his way in the car. But what's truly interesting about what you did... Uh, Jeez, Dave, has it been 23 years ago? Since the earthquake? Yeah. 1971. 23 years ago. And now, Tom, we go into a restaurant, we sit across the room from one another, and we look at each other's plate and wonder what we're eating so we could stay slim. <laughs> but I think what, what you demonstrated then and what we're learning tonight is that you just stay calm and do the best you can, and they understand. They get it out there. You know, they know we're doing the best we can. If you were do Remember they ran the ads of you in the yeah. newspaper? Earthquake Horowitz. They call me Earthquake Horowitz. Did you get any awards for that or um, extra pay? Actually, let me tell you what happened, Tom. Um, I got no awards for that. As a matter of fact, they refused to pay me for the live telecast because <laughs> they said it wasn't commercial. No, it wasn't commercial. It wasn't commercial. But, you know, we roll with that stuff. You know, they... Uh, Absolutely. We roll with that stuff. Absolutely. You know, it's part, but it's part of the business. You know, it's interesting yeah. that you're doing this, and this is very natural for you yeah. because, you, you know, you're a person who's been doing this for a long time, yeah. is that you handle things in a way that you really handle them as though you're doing your work. Yeah. And, you know, four years ago, I was in the studio as you were talking about this guy that came in back of me with a gun and, and held me hostage. Well, at first I thought it was a joke, that one of the guys in the staff was playing a joke. Yeah, and having or, or, or your agent the, was there. One or of the my two. agent, yeah. or, you know, the boss or whatever. And uh, people said, well, why were you so calm doing this? And it wasn't that I was calm, because if you watched me from the waist down, you knew I wasn't calm. But... Um, it's because you're just doing your job. Yeah. You know that you're out there and you're trying to communicate, you're trying to make the best of a situation that happens, and it comes very easy to you when you're a professional. And Tom, you are the ultimate, my Ah, friend. you're very kind. Hey, you, uh, you know why I do it? I, I do it because I love it so much, it's scary. I would truly do it for nothing. Uh, and and uh, there's, there's something about broadcasters, and you know this. Right. Man, when your station or your, your network is in trouble, I'll do anything. To keep my station on the air, anything. That's right, and yeah. you don't you don't think about hey, I'm doing. You just you just as I'm demonstrating doing. here tonight. <laughs> so what are we gonna do about fire safety? Uh, probably nothing. Okay. You know, uh, we'll be right back though. There is a fire sale. I told you, at CNBC tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Geraldo's marked down <laughs> daily. Just kidding, Geraldo. We'll be right back after these messages on CNBC. Here we go for it. We are back with my friend David Horowitz. Uh, for people who don't know, somebody came in the studio and put a gun in your gut, right? That's right. Yeah. In my head. At your head? Yeah. Uh, back of my head there. And do, did we ever find out how they get past building security? There was no security. Of course. Of <laughs> course. Now, afterward, actually, that incident served as an incident that brought about all the heavy security, particularly that we have here on the NBC lot. Yeah. Because people walk into the studio. You know, you can come into the studio dressed like a ninja and say you're going to the Carson show, uh -huh. and they put you on. Hey, the great thing was... When I worked at ABC over at Prospect and yeah. Talmadge, we had a guy over there who didn't carry a full load. You know what I mean? The I know. Guard. I met him. Yeah, Eddie. Okay, <laughs> Eddie. I mean, if you came in with the plastique strapped to your to your to your stomach and the little spit coming down here, Eddie'd say, "Oh yeah, Snyder show. It's right down there." And uh, you know, you know, uh, park your car in the fire lane. You want to get out of here in a hurry. I mean, <laughs> and what I love is, when I used to work at NBC in New York, we would have to show our passes to security. But if a nobody came in with a brown paper bag and said, "Coffee for Fred Silverman," go right up. Exactly. You're, you're not, oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Let me go to uh, Greta somewhere in Georgia. Hello. Hello. Hi, Greta. It's Tom. How are you? I'm doing fine. Good. Say hi to David Horowitz. He's hi, right Greta. Here. How are you? Where are you in Georgia, Greta? Smyrna, Georgia. Savannah. Smyrna. 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 Oh, Smyrna, Georgia. That's a nice town. I've been in Smyrna. So have I. <laughs> Near Marietta, outside yes. of Atlanta. Uh, my question is about what do you think about all these, these food stories, you know, these they call the food police stories, the popcorn stories, and the well, yeah, the stories. scare stories. But now, but, but now you can't have popcorn in the no. movie. Ah, but, but Tom, you know the interesting part about this? These stories are old stories. These stories have been done 15 times. Yeah. And I'm not saying, hey, we did it, we did it, but they have. And the whole point is, if people want to eat the popcorn, if they enjoy the popcorn with the coconut oil or the palm kernel oil, or they have the a choice. Butter. Or the butter you have a choice to buy it. You could buy that popcorn. Now the theaters are running scared because of this report. The AMC theaters are using canola oil. Well, it still has saturated fat. Of course. And, and I think these things just scare the hell out of people, make them say, well, look, I'm going to clog my arteries. It's like eating 12 Big Macs. Screw it. If you like the stuff, eat, eat it. it. 
You know, Greta, I've, I'm so fond of saying this line. They say, well, if only we, we would not do this or not do that, think of how many lives we could save. Exactly. Greta, in the history of the world, with the possible exception of Jesus Christ, we have never saved one life. They, everybody's died. They all, we're all going to die, Greta. But they've got you and me convinced that death is a curable disease. Mm -hmm. They really do. Yeah, but, but you know, while we're on the while we're on this earth, Man, why I'm, not take I'm, advantage I'm, of it? Of course, I mean, I, I, to me, let me tell you, filet mignon is a gift from God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a pretty beefy remark. That certainly Ooh. is. Well, I don't want to. I, I don't. I don't want to go to round two here. We'll get to the meat of this. <laughs> oh, please, you're starting to grind me. <laughs> no. Don't try to chuck that off. I, I'll have to drive a stake <laughs> through your heart. <laughs> oh, God. Red, I'm glad you called. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. You work for the competition. You yes. work for CBS in Los Angeles. Well, I also work for CNBC. I understand yeah. that. But now you were, you were to right. do a spot at CBS this afternoon. Now, let me tell you what happened. Mm -hmm. I went in. I found out that you guys were in trouble. Mm -hmm. I went into the news director, Frank Jordan, who was sitting in his office, up to his ears and trying to put a show on. And I said, Frank, CNBC's in trouble. They have a fire in New York, a real serious fire. They need help out there. They're going to have to fill time on the program. And they would like me to go out to help Tom Snyder. And he said, if you want to leave, you can leave anytime you want and go out and do it. What is that man's name? Frank Jordan. Mr. Jordan? Mr. I, Jordan. Mr. Jordan, I'm in your debt. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And that's the competition. Uh, by the way, it's, it's Bob Jordan. Oh, but oh, did, did I say, you know who Frank Jordan is? I, Wait a second. The, the piano player at Minsky's. No, oh, what no. do I know? Frank Jordan, Tom. Frank Jordan was an NBC person in Chicago. He was oh, really? a news director in Chicago. Okay. So I think of Bob Jordan, and that was Michael Horowitz, who's no relation, spells his name differently. CZ, who yeah. Who came and tells because he used to work at KCBS. That's right. That's yes. right. Bob Jordan. Bob Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan. I never, I never got From it wrong. From Seattle. From Seattle. Yes. One of my favorite towns. We're doing shows up there in June. Bob, come on up. Take me. <laughs> <laughs> I might do that. I would love it. Ted in Davenport, Iowa. Hello. Actually, it's T. Oh, T. I'm sorry. T oh. in Davenport. Hi. How are you? I'm just fine. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry it took a fire, but I finally got my wish. Several hours of color casting with my very favorite host. Oh, thanks. You're very kind, T. I appreciate that. How's everything in Davenport tonight? Not too bad. The uh, sun was out today. We got a chance, a uh, clear shot at the uh, the eclipse. Now, did you watch the eclipse? Yeah, I'm afraid I did. Oh, my God. And you didn't... You stared directly up into the sun. Oh, no, you didn't. Really? No, I did not. Oh, because if you do, you're going to die. You know that. Hmm? You, you lose your sight. And you know what I did is I watched the eclipse, and then to have some real fun, I watched some paint dry for a while. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then... And then I spent the rest of the afternoon watching the grass grow. I've had a big no, day. No, no, no. But, but I have to ask T a question. Go ahead. T, I yeah, lived okay. in... Actually, I have a question uh, for both you, Tom, and for David. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, David, what's the strangest reaction you've ever had to confronting someone with a, a rip-off or, or a consum consumer problem? I mean, face-to-face. -face. Has anyone ever... All right, let me like, tell you what happened. And this was, this was hysterical. I was uh, going after a guy in a store. The guy was selling some toys that were manufactured dangerous toys. And I came in, camera rolling. This is when I worked for NBC. And I said, you're selling these look-alike toy guns. You shouldn't be selling them. This guy ran into the bathroom, <clears throat> locked the door in the bathroom. <laughs> I heard the shower going. And I knocked on the door. And I said, are you OK? And he said, I have to take a shower. And that was, I think, the most unusual thing that ever happened. That's very unusual. I beg your pardon? Trying to come out clean. Well, what I was going to say, he never did come clean because I didn't wait around for him. We just rolled on the table. I walked over, all over that joke. But, T, let me ask you a question. Tom and I have wanted to ask this question about people who live in Davenport for years because, as I said, oh. I lived in Des Moines. Was Davenport named after a couch manufacturer? You know, I have not a clue in the world. I came here by way of Duluth, Minnesota, by way of California. Mm -hmm. so I well, okay, that was... That didn't work. Mm -mm. No, sure didn't. Davenport. Isn't Davenport a couch? Davenport is an old name for a sofa in the living room. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. But, but I think, I'm not even going to get into this, but I think, it's, I think it's an Americanization of a French person who settled the area way back when it was settled. I think that. It was Monsieur Davenport. 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 Now we're going to get letters from Davenport, the Chamber no, of Commerce. No, no, no. Yeah. All right, anyway. Hey, Davenport's a great town. Of course it's, it's a great town. It's one of the Quad Cities. Uh, T, uh, what's I your... got one question for you real quick. Okay. Okay, uh, I, I just want to know, have you ever had to tap dance like this on the air before? I mean, for oh, such yeah. a long period of time? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I did three hours of radio every night for ABC, so, I mean, I'm used to the long haul. Oh, and sure, I... but it's not the same thing. 
Well, you know, when you're you're caught unawares and you you know you prepared an hour long show and yeah. now you know you have to fill three hours. But uh, T, let me tell you something. I have known this guy for 20 years. We have spent evenings together where Tom would talk for three hours. Oh, stop it. We, you did. Oh, stop it. And he was it. Mar marvelous. This oh, guy, stop This guy it. is a font of knowledge. He really is. He's fabulous. And it's very natural for him. He is. He's the greatest. T, I'm glad you called. Thanks. Thank you. All right, bye-bye now. Bye. David, thanks for coming by. Anytime. My thanks to Mr. Sterling Smith at the keyboard tonight. What's the band again? The Hodads. The Hodads, okay. A composer here in the Los Angeles right. area. Right. And his friend Chris Wilde called him on the phone and said, Tom's in trouble. Go and help him. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Sterling. Thank you. Okay. We will continue with, I believe, uh, Sam Rubin. Yes, sir. Of the Entertainment uh, Report on Channel 5. And uh, we'll be right back after this message. <laughs> I'm Tom filling in tonight for Geraldo Rivera on our color cast, uh, all of CNBC's programming out of Fort Lee, New Jersey. Washington, New York has been canceled today because of a fire at our facility in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And I understand, and I'm smacking here because Jim Lucero at the Smokehouse sent over garlic toast and filet mignon and vegetables, crudite. And <laughs> I got a little here in my teeth. Anyway, we hope to have the network up and running out of 30 Rockefeller Plaza tomorrow for people who depend upon us for financial information. Joining us now from NBC in Los Angeles and Channel 4 KNBC is weather reporter Fritz Coleman. We used to have a program very late at night on Saturday called It's Fritz, a it's comedy Fritz. program. Yeah. So you, you double in comedy and you also report weather. Yeah. Well, I, I was a comedian, and that's how I got my job as weather. I was a stand. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was yeah. at the, well, some people think I that you people, try I thought people saw your weather forecast and said, man, this guy's funny. <laughs> yeah, well, we do that when we tap dance, as you well know. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, that's how I got the job. I was working at the comedy store, and the news director saw me there and offered me an audition. You know, weather being non-existent is like being a surf instructor in Kansas, so they filled the position with a comedian. And do you still do the comedy store? Do you still go there and do that? I notice yeah. you backstage at The Tonight Show quite often. Yeah. You're a fan of comedy, and, yeah. and I know you write a lot of yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you still did dates. Oh, yeah. I do two or three nights a week if I can at the Improv and various other places. Very a lot good. Of fun. Very yeah. good. And, and forgive my asking, but the television show, like all shows, it ran its course? And yeah, it just got a little too expensive to do a, a local show yeah. like that every week without syndicating it or getting a group of stations to sort of amortize the gotcha. cost. Gotcha, gotcha. And we tried to syndicate it, we, we, but we tried at a bad time because that's when Rick Dees and Arsenio and Pat Sajak all went on with Late Night. Nobody yeah. cared about Late Night. It was too full. Yeah. Let me ask you about weather reporting in Los Angeles. That's a very difficult assignment because unlike back east where all winter long there's news every other day, it kind of settles in here from now until, what, December? There's yeah. really not too much going on. Yeah, your morning clouds and fog, hazy afternoon sun until Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. My job every night is to try to think of ways to make the sound, uh, to, to make the weather sound actually more important than it is. A drizzle advisory from the National Weather Service. Mm -hmm. Don't leave your home in silk or suede clothing due to spotting. That, that's the <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, but, but when it's weird, it's really weird because we're by an ocean. We're a desert by an ocean. So yeah. weather does very weird things. So you have several times a year when you can be dramatically wrong, as we've witnessed in the last month. I'll tell you, the last weekend, for example, last Thursday night, I, I saw you over at the studio mm -hmm. last Thursday, and I was flying up to San Francisco that night, and you were going on and on about hailstorm and thunder, and, on and, on, and I'm thinking, geez, I'm going to go to the airport, and it's going to be terrible. It was the smoothest flight I've had in years. I know. Well, <laughs> well we just want to make, make sure people are prepared. I, uh, we, we had a weather situation last weekend, which was called, without being too technical, a cutoff low, which is a storm, sort of uh, uh, a renegade, uh, prodigal sunstorm that doesn't tell us exactly what it's going to do, uh -huh. and, it, and it spent the weekend doing what we told it not to do, and it was a little rough, and I apologize for having made you rearrange your plans. No, I didn't rearrange my plans no. at all. However, I, and I'm not going to, in, I'm, I'm not including you in this, but there are some who would make it seem that if an approaching rainstorm is a national disaster, which is going to cost many, many lives, you know, it's only water. 
That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. You know. People who are from other parts of the country find that very weird. We make weather a big deal out yeah. here because yeah. rain is so infrequent, drizzling. We don't know how to drive in it. We don't know how to react to it. But uh, as we've seen over the last couple of years, weather has become a story big. I, I mean, what I mean is uh, we have mudslides in Malibu, and we have, you know, uh, Noah would stay away from Southern California. This is true. Yeah. yeah. This is true. Uh, homes are moving, and brush fires are caused by dry periods, so it can be catastrophic, although it that's, doesn't happen that often. We are with Fritz Coleman. Here's Mary in St. Louis, Missouri. Hello. Good evening, Tom. I have to thank you for a beautiful experience I had today because of your show last night. Which was what? I got out my little mirror. Oh, you were the teacher, right? No, 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 no. No, I'm from St. Louis. The teacher was from Gary, Indiana. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, I got my little mirror out, and I was showing, reflecting the eclipse on the house for the kids next door. Yeah, there it is on the screen right yeah, there. Yeah, I there, see there. it. Yep, yep. And I was leaving and walking up to my patio, which has about four trees around it. Uh-huh. The sun shining through the leaves on the patio. It was hundreds of eclipses. Wow. I'll it, bet that was something. It was fascinating. And my first thought was, I've got to call Tom tonight and thank him. <laughs> where I should oh, have you're been so smart. nice. Oh, oh, I should have been smart and gone and gotten a camera, but I didn't. You know, oh, sure. I have a degree in hindsight. Yeah, well, we all have 2020 there, Mary. You know what I mean? Oh, I've, I've got about 2025. Oh, you're so... And so you're weatherman. Okay. At least he can't be blamed for the three feet of flurries that we have to shovel back here in this part of the country. When? Today? Anytime. Oh, right. Because you don't have it out there like we do. Uh -uh. Well, you know what? You bring up a good point. You know what I've been discussing with weathermen from back east for the last two or three months? They say that they would rather experience one little 45-second earthquake. Oh, yeah. Rather than the 15 relentless storms oh. they've had back there. But when you think about it, what happens if it snows? You, 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 you put a log in the fire and have another cup of hot chocolate. Here's what happens out here. No, we, we, we do that a little bit differently at my house. We do put the log on the fire, right, but well. we don't use cups. We tend to use glasses for... Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but here's what happens in California. One day you're sitting by a pool at a home you've worked all your life to afford, and the next day you're living in a tent in a park trying to borrow a spam key from an undocumented citizen. So I would challenge anybody who uh, would rather exchange a cold winter for a earthquake? Oh, absolutely, cold. absolutely. Mary, I'm glad you called. Bless you for your kindness and thank, thank you. I have one question for you. Okay. I sent you a card for you know what day. Yeah. I don't know whether you've gotten it or read it yet. But I, some... I, I, I'm, I'm going to open all those cards over the weekend, and I, and I thank everybody who sent one. I appreciate it, and, 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 but you know what I'm saying? Yes, no, but just let me know which finger you used. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's Mary. It's shoebox Maxine card. All right. Love you. Love you back, Mary. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Here is, and I'm, ho is, is this the right name, Bruca? Hello. Bruce. It's Bruce. Oh, Bruce. It's just spelled differently. <laughs> uh, Bruce in Alexandria, Virginia. Hello. Hi, good evening, Tom. Good evening, Bruce. They got you as Bruca up there on the thing. <laughs> I, I didn't think that was going to work, pal. Well, since there's no graphics on the screen, it doesn't bother me. It may neither. What can I do? What can I do? Well, first of all, Tom, I want the deluxe membership, so I'm sending you 15 bucks. Don't send any money, okay? No money at all. No, no, just your good, just your good wishes. All right. Well, my good wishes are to you, and we're sitting here in Alexandria, thinking how lucky CNBC is to have somebody like you to fill in for three and a half hours with such a tremendous. Hey, program. listen, anybody, if if there were somebody else, he or she would do it here just as well, or since, almost as well. Since you're doing yourself <laughs> to fill in your time tonight, my friend. I figured I'd play Stump Tom Snyder and ask you what CNBC stood for. Uh, the original uh, meaning of it was the Consumer News and Business Channel. I now now it stands for certainly no bonus for Christmas. <laughs> 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 I'm out of time, Bruce, but thanks for your good wishes and thanks for calling. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Fritz, thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Uh, tomorrow, Fun to be a part of tomorrow, uh, Tomorrow's weather, uh, uh, mor morning fog. Morning clouds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sunny all day. Okay. <laughs> okay. We are with Fritz Coleman, weather uh, forecaster and uh, comedian here in Los Angeles, who is our colleague over at KNBC and the NBC Television Network. Back after these messages.
Good evening, folks, and welcome back, everybody. I'm Tom, and this is the Color Cast now for the 10th of May. It's uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. The year is 1994, the day of the eclipse. Hope you saw it. Hope you enjoyed it. We have pictures along the way. As you all know, we are extending ourselves here at uh, CNBC in Burbank, California, to cover most of the primetime programming of CNBC. We had a fire today at our facility in uh, Fort Lee, New Jersey, uh, over there on Fletcher Avenue on the fifth floor. It took out, I believe, a... I thought I heard a, a noise coming from you. No, sir, not at all. Maybe a little chewing. Oh, okay. It sounded to me like no, air escaping. No, no, there was no air escaping. Okay, at all. fine. Thank you. <laughs> this is a new year. I, <laughs> yeah, but it's the same old you. Well, you are true. You are true. <laughs> anyway, they had a fire in the uh, in the battery section on the fifth floor today, and it took it took everything out. Now they're assessing the damage back there. It was a two alarm fire. And thanks to uh, some people at NBC at 30 Rockefeller Plaza, we are maintaining transmission of our programs from the West Coast. But because Geraldo and Mary Madeline and Cal Thomas and Bob Berkowitz um, are not here, uh, we're doing the best we can with myself and our crew and people on the phone and people we know to keep the programming going and give the network and our cable affiliates something to show uh, tonight. Hopefully this will all be rectified tomorrow night. And Maybe I'll be given three nights off. Ha! Yeah, ha. Huh. Ha! <laughs> anyway, on tonight's program, very funny comedian is on the show. Her name is Donna Jordan. And then a little bit later on, Mr. Mike Blake, who was here with us about a year ago to talk about baseball now that the season is underway. Uh, the toll-free line is up and running as always here at 800-745-2622. We'll take your phone calls as we go along. But do remember, what did I say? Donna. Oh, I'm sorry, Diana Jordan. It's right there on the prompter, and I... I'll tell you, I'm getting a little, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, a little, yeah, 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 I've been out here a long time. Absolutely. Give me a mistake, folks, you know. Hey, that's right. yeah. Colortinis. Colortinis? Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, I hope you enjoy tonight's program. Diana Jordan is our first guest tonight. A little bit later on, Mr. Mike Blake will be with us. Uh, as I say, all the programming coming out of uh, Burbank tonight, but hopefully, for those of you who depend upon us for market information and financial news and news in the morning, uh, I'm sure that our people will work around the clock tonight trying to get something going from uh, CNBC uh, out of Manhattan. And if I can, I will get that information for you before we sign off here at 11.30 p.m. Eastern, uh, Eastern Daylight Time tonight. We will also do the, uh, the Bob Berkowitz program at 8 o'clock, but it won't be quite the same. <laughs> It'll be a little, a little different. Although, you know, we should hold Diana Jordan because she's in Playboy magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, we could do the Bob Berkowitz thing. The, uh... So what is it like to expose your breasts to Playboy magazine? Was it fun for you? <laughs> and then Bob gives it that serious look, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, How do you feel about the size of your breasts? <laughs> Bob, is it that? Not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we won't be doing that. Ah. Back with tonight's color cast. Settle back, fire up a color teeny, and enjoy the pictures as they fly through the air. Thanks for watching, everybody. We're coming right back. <laughs> we are back and joined by Diana Jordan, who is among America's fastest rising young comedians. She has signed a deal with CBS to star in her own sitcom based upon her successful, long-running, one-woman show called Female, Fertile, and Frustrated, which has been playing to sold-out crowds around the country for the past year. She has also published her first book, and gang, this is a good one. It's called A Wife's Little Instruction Book, Your Survival Guide to Marriage Without Bloodshed. And the good thing about this for guys is you can hold it in your hand and read it quickly. <laughs> that was the whole idea. Yeah, well, it's uh, also written with a man. Yeah, I wrote I, it with a man uh, as well. That, Paul that's Seaburn. right. That's right. Uh, Paul Seaburn. Uh -huh. And anyway, I'm sorry I said Donna. I should have said Diana. But my tongue got in the way of my eye teeth, and I couldn't see the prompter there for a uh, second. It was thinking about the play. You know, I, I was teasing Berkowitz, and he, I got him on the phone line. Can I put him on for just Ab a second? Oh, okay. Yes. Hey, Bob, it's Tom. How are you? Hi, Tom. How are you doing, pal? Oh, okay. I'm here with Diana Jordan, who I think was going to be on your program, but for some reason it didn't happen. She's got to keep her clothes on on my show, Tom. Yeah, well, oh, stop that's it. not what Elaine told me. <laughs> You know Elaine? I do know Elaine. Okay. Anyway, Burko, where were you when the fire hit today? Well, I was I was driving to work, and I was getting right off the George Washington Bridge. Yeah. You know, we're, we're on the other bridge. Yep. 
and I'm pulling up, and there's this huge traffic jam as, as, as sort of getting on to Fletcher Avenue, which is where CNBC is. Yeah, yeah. And it's a gorgeous day, and I got the roof open, and I got the 18-year-old Mercedes. It's just, it's just, you know. Oh, I thought up. you said you had the 18-year-old the in the Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> I missed it that Mercedes about five years ago. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. And there's this huge traffic jam, and I'm seeing these cop cars, and I, as I'm inching up, I'm starting to see like about a dozen fire trucks. Yeah. And we had a hot show last night. Yeah, yeah. I, you knew the show was on fire last night. That's right, that. but yeah. I didn't think it was that. Yeah. And I, I pull up, I finally pull up there, and the entire building is, everybody from the building is in front of... Uh, of 2200 Fletcher Avenue, yeah, which is yeah, our world yeah. headquarters there. So anyway, what do you hear about getting back on back there tomorrow night? I think night? we're going to get on tomorrow night, Tom. Uh, there was apparently a, a transformer blew up yeah. or exploded or caught fire or something like that, and the batteries were leaking, and some hazardous materials were out. Now, Roger Ailes, as you know, he's our president, our yeah. friend. He accused me of leaving the vibrators plugged in, and that's why we had the fire. <laughs> uh, I denied it, of course. Yeah. He comes up to me and says, Burke... No sex tonight, pal. I said, says you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, take care, Robert, and I'll, I'll do your half hour. Is there anything you want me to cover tonight? Uh, it's uncovering on our show time. Okay. Take okay. care, Robert. We look forward to seeing you back here tomorrow night. See you too, All right, bye-bye. Anyway, thanks for the time, Diana, and now let's get to you. One of the fastest-rising young comedians, and I understand that, you're, uh, that, that the routine that you do about the frustration of being female today while it chides men, doesn't really put us down completely. I hope that's true. No, that's, you're right. You're right. It's, um, actually, the, the good thing about my show is women walk out of it feeling better. Mm -hmm. The female fertile and frustrated. Yeah. They come up, this is really interesting. They come up to me after the show and they say, you know, I, I feel so much better after seeing your show because I thought my husband or my boyfriend was the only man that ever did that. And now I feel so much better knowing that they're, they're not the only ones. They, and I go, no, they all do that. Because you, know, <laughs> you know women always want to be the victim. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. What is it with women that, they're, that, that, like you say, they walk out of your show and they feel better about themselves? Why wouldn't they feel good about themselves, period? Why don't women feel better about this? Well, I think you just said it, period. <laughs> that's <something> that I, <laughs> PMS, that's, yeah. Really? That's, oh, well, that is a problem, yeah, that's... But, I mean... You I, know, and you have to talk about it. I know, I know women that are truly attractive, and they think they're not. I know women who are truly slender, and they think they're too fat, and I yeah. think, what, what is it? I mean, well, geez. it's you. You're the ones that did it no, to us. I, yes, it is. No. You run Madison Avenue. You run Wall Street. You make us think that we have to look perfect ooh, all the time. Ooh. Why do you think we have to do this stuff? Why I had to do this at 40 years old? To show that you can be pretty and attractive and look great. Let me ask you a question. Have, you, right. got, have you got kids at all? No. Oh. I've been to Chuck E. Cheese. Okay. I'm not <laughs> having it. <laughs> I remember talking to a lady when they did the NFL cheerleaders in here who had a two-year-old daughter. Uh-huh. And it was back in my days, you know, when I would confront people and I'd say, well, what are you going to tell your children? When they find out that you pose for Playboy Mag, you know, that kind of stuff, uh -huh. but which I find... My dog is upset, but go ahead. She said, let me tell you, when my daughter is old enough to know, I want to go to her, because she says, I'll be 45 or 50 then, you know, starting to fade. And I'm going to say, hey, I was good enough for Playboy yeah. Kid. Yeah. Don't mess with me, little yeah. sister. There but, is something to that. Damn, there straight. is. You there should is. be proud that you're I am. Playboy. I am. First of all, I never got cheerleader, and that, you know, really damn hurt. Straight. That yep. hurt. yep. And I wanted to do it uh, before my nipples started to look like Marty Feldman's eyes. I thought, well, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, it was, and it was scary, but it was fun because <laughs> you're <laughs> one yeah. of the few that remembers old Marty Feldman. Yeah. I see. No, uh, it's just I don't know if I want to open the magazine. No, I said before. I said before. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, yeah, you're right. It's a, I think every woman wants to have beautiful pictures. Look at these boudoir pictures now. The, yeah. How these are booming, yeah. these glamour shots. People yeah, going yeah, there for $39.95 yeah. and get made up and look fabulous. And, and uh, you know, I was you talking look to that a woman, way. I was talking to a woman one time. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you know, you shave the legs, you shave the pits, you know, the looks. And the you. waxing. Don't forget the but waxing. The waxing, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you got the waxing, uh, you know, if you're her suit and you got the earrings you got to have and the jewel. I said, who convinced you that you got to go through this drill every morning? Who did this to you? It well, wasn't. You, you know, it wasn't. Man, I'll tell you who it was. Oh. Your mom. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of it. Yeah. Well, you know, there's the old thing, too, that I mean, women you, dress you for other women. Yeah, they do. You know why? Because you don't know. If I had didn't have fingernail polish on right now, or I didn't have whatever, you know, you'd never know. I could come in here right out of, waking up in the morning, and you'd go, you look fine. If you came in here uh, improperly dressed or made up for television, that I would notice. But if you didn't wear earrings, it wouldn't bother me in the slightest, you know? I mean, I, th I think you have a wonderful face. I think you have good skin tone, you know? You have nice facial structure. You don't, you don't need all that stuff. I'm telling you right now. And I th and Are you I, one of those men who thinks that women don't need makeup? Yeah, I am. I, you know, oh, I, just think, I, I think women are just terrific just the way God made them. Oh, I think they're you've wonderful. You've not seen a lot of women in the morning. Then. Yes, I have. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, I have. Then you were very and, young. And, 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 and by the way, do you think I look like a million bucks when I get up in the morning? Huh? No. My hair doesn't sleep well because it's, yeah. getting, it's getting grayer and it's getting, you know, where it kinks a lot when I sleep on it, you know, and my breath gets foul and I got stubble. I look, I look like hell some mornings. But, I mean, if I had a woman living with me, I, I, I would want her to think I look good when I got up. I'm going to clean up later on, honey. Don't worry about it. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the way we lose men, though, to, to 25-year-olds. How's that? If we don't look good all the time. It's, it's a pressure. It really is. Well, I'll tell you something. You'd never lose me to a 25-year-old. I Me think, neither. I, I think 25 year olds should go out with 25 year olds. Yeah, you know, I, I think agree. grandmothers should go to bed with grandfathers. I'm very old fashioned and very square. Well, about you know, that. something real interesting, too, in my show. What's that noise? The air oh, the air conditioning. Yeah. I'm just a little squirrely, aren't I? <laughs> it's another fire. Um, I have women fill out these cards uh, uh, before the show. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What do, uh, what's your. Um, What's your biggest complaint about women? Uh -huh. Then what's your biggest complaint about men? What's your biggest complaint about yourself? What's men's best quality? What's your best quality? This is unbelievable to me. This is, uh, you, you won't believe this when okay. I tell you. I probably have five or 6,000 of these from all over the country. Okay. What women say about other women. Terrible. Like Backstabbing, two-faced, bitches, jealous always think they're too fat when they're skinny but the biggest thing was backstabbing and jealous and i mean i will read those at the end of the show and i'll say you know ladies before we can get along with men we better figure out how we can get along with each other thank you thank you and what do they say about men what do they hate the most about us besides the fact that we can see the puck see the puck thought, when we go to hockey games we can, <laughs> we, we, we can, i thought maybe that was some weird no 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 we, we, we know where the puck is at all oh. times oh, oh you know you go with the lady and she said well what are they i said puck's right there no Kate. we don't oh, you know it's over there. that's Hi. a big earring that's a big <laughs> diaphragm <laughs> Honey, you better get that over here. All right, let me do a fast commercial, then okay. we're back with all the folks on the toll-free exchange at 800-745-2622. It's by Diana Jordan. It's called and A Wife's Little Instruction Book. We're coming right back. Don't be...